You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for January 24th, 2020. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where our three impeachment managers, Lagavulin, Oban, and Kendall Jackson Chardonnay, have performed nearly as well as the House impeachment managers. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. I think that, uh, you know, the impeachment managers have done a perfect job. I think I think the impeachment managers are a 16-year-old Lagavulin. <laughs> and uh, smooth, <laughs> smoky, uh, <laughs> aged to perfection, and gets the goddamn job done. Um, yep. they, they've been, they have been perfect, and that's going to actually be the subject of a lot of our conversation today. They have been absolutely perfect. Um, we'd like to welcome a new sponsor, uh, Temporary. Sponsor. Don't think they'll be around uh, much longer than this week or the next. But uh, our new sponsor this week is Bread on a Pike. It's the perfect pre verdict gift for any juror to let them know that you're thinking of them, but not in a good way. Bread on a Pike, it's menacingly delicious. I had to go to a waiting room. Now, everything's fine. You don't need to worry about anybody and me or my family or anything like that at all. But I was in a waiting room for two hours yesterday and on the TV, Mm -hmm. which only did not have any cable news at all on the television. I had control over the TV. Uh-huh. Uh, God, local news is bad mm-hmm. <laughs> in Springfield, Illinois. Oh yep. my God. Yep. So bad. It is literally reading Facebook posts about a dog, a puppy caught in a wheel. And yeah, just terrible. But one of the things that I watched was the CBS Evening News, which used to be in the late 60s when i was five to seven years old Mm -hmm. something we watched every night in our house you watched walter cronkite that's just what you You did huntley and brinkley you had walter cronkite you had you know you had these credible old white men frankly um telling you about the war and so forth Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep and uh this was so quick paced and jumpy and uh Every reporter had one sentence, and then we clipped on to the next story, whether it was impeachment or some special human interest story about a dad and his son giving food to the homeless. I mean, it just went jump, 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 jump. So I got a newfound appreciation for cable news being a big step up from that. You and I criticize cable news a lot, but they do stick to one topic. They might have the wrong pundits on a lot of the time, but they're talking about one topic for more than a minute. So, well, and I was uh, at an event today, uh, a monthly thing that we have here, a meeting of concerned citizens, and we listen to uh, the mayor and we listen to uh, the head of the Sangamon County Board talk about stuff. And there were substantive questions asked, and a lot of word salad was thrown back at people who asked questions. But the reason I bring this up is. I ran into a local reporter who has reported on us, Blue Gal, uh, on the uh-huh. way out. And he said, I got here late. Did I miss anything? <laughs> kind of like, oh, man, really? Really? Okay. Because I know he's he, people like that. There's like this paper has like one reporter that does 12 beats. So he got here like right. 15 minutes late. And he's like, did, did the mayor say anything? And I could have told him anything. I said, yeah, we're getting nuclear weapons. Yeah, definitely. We're, you know, we're, we're, going, we're becoming a nuclear superpower, and that should tell Chicago to fuck off. The resources of local news are already stretched so thin because of budget cuts. So that what you have, um, what the times I've been interviewed on local news, which has happened, or even it's just a weather report, it's a 12-year-old, God bless him, standing on a street corner talking about how slushy it is out here. The CBS Evening News last night, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Drift Glass, but getting back to that, they had the story about someone mentioning that if two Republican senators, that if you vote against the president, you're going to have your head on a pike. Yeah, and it wasn't just somebody. It was a leaked Trump confidant. This was one of those, you know. Confidant, yes. You know, this is is sending a a fish home wrapped up in the body armor of your hitman. This is a Sicilian message. This is, you know. 
this is mm-hmm. a, this is an offer you can't refuse from a mob boss. Let's face it, Donald Trump thinks, talks, acts um, like a mob boss, like well, like like a well, pretend mob boss. The more he's cornered, the more he yeah. sounds like a mob. But he's boss, always been a dick. Say. He's always wanted. To, he's always been a yeah. wannabe tough guy. He's yeah. always been a coward. His whole life he's been a coward. His whole family are cowards. He runs from every fight. Anyone who's actually half his size who stands up to him scares the shit out of him. But he's always been, you know, one of those asshole wannabe tough guys who hides behind his bodyguards. And so now that he's got nuclear weapons, um, and now that he's cornered like a rat, um, he his inner thug is just right on the surface. And that's why he can lean back and, and ask, you know, whoever's passing him by, the waiter or something, to take you know Marie Ivanovich out. Um, which is a story this mm-hmm. week. Mob boss Trump orders yeah. what sounds a lot like to me like a hit on one of his own ambassadors. And Lordy, there are tapes. We found this week exhilarating and at the same time incredibly depressing that this this is where our democracy is. And it is. It's um do you want to jump in first or you want me to? Well, I want you to talk about the flawless case that the Democrats have made against Trump this week. Yeah. Well, um over the last three days, the, the Democrats, the House managers have run a genuinely flawless case against Donald Trump. There's, you know, the saying about if this was a fight, they would have stopped it. If this was a fight, they would have pounded Trump through the canvas into the basement. There's no doubt that he fucking broke the law, that he, that he betrayed the Constitution, that he sold his country out, that he tried to extort a, a foreign power to get dirt on his political opponent. He got a whole bunch of people involved in that illegal and immoral and unconstitutional and impeachable effort and then worked his ass off to cover it up. The minute it, it it blew open on it, there's no doubt about any of that. There's no there's no evidence to the contrary. Nobody's putting up a defense saying it didn't happen. There's a lot of distraction going on, but there's no evidence saying. And here's the thing: the House managers were uniformly professional and cogent and compelling, and it didn't matter. It's not going to matter uh, because our real problem is the Republican Party. Um, I was sitting here thinking just today, as Adam Schiff was referring to Atticus Finch and To Kill a Mockingbird, I was writing a talking point for our notes about Atticus Finch and To Kill a Mockingbird, which is weird. I wish they'd stop reading my mind. Um, but my point was that Adam Schiff's arguments were as powerful and true and airtight and ultimately useless as Atticus Finch's defense of Tom Robinson in To Kill a Mockingbird. The jury has already made up its mind. The judge is already, you know, down with the whole thing. There's no force on God's earth that's going to make the Republican Party defend this fucking country. And so we are all being treated to watching the Republican Party put a gun to the head of our Constitution and pull the trigger over and over again in full knowledge of what they are doing. This is the equivalent of shelling Fort Sumter. This is the equivalent of breaking away from the Union, declaring war on the United States Constitution. And they're doing it in public, and they're doing it in prime time, and they're doing it in full knowledge of what they're doing to follow their leader off the cliff. We are now at war with the Republican Party. They are now a hostile power in charge of our country, and they're wrecking our country, and they're probably going to get away with it. And the only solution is coming in November, which is an election, to drive them forever out of power. But what what, what we need to do further is repudiate them. To be a Republican needs to be the most shameful thing imaginable for the next two generations. People need to be terrified to admit to their neighbors that they were ever a Republican. And not in the way that happened after the Bush administration, which was they slithered into the bushes, put on T-shirts that said, don't tread on me, and came, you know, came prancing out saying, I'm an independent. I don't know who George Bush even was. No, 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 no. These people need to be driven from public life for the rest of our lives. They cannot be trusted with power. They will always abuse it. They will always fuck this country over with it. And and they will always hand it to the worst among them. Did you hear yet the caller on C-SPAN last night? Um, I put a video up at Crooks and Liars of this these two callers who were on C-SPAN. And the second caller got attention because the first caller was so mm-hmm. emotional. The first caller was a man who uh, said he was terrified for our democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think he was so overwhelmed by actually getting through to C-SPAN and being on the air that it got to him the import of what he was saying because he started Mm -hmm. to cry. 
and C-SPAN can't really handle people crying no. on the air. There's not much they can do for them. And they they ended the call and went on to a woman from Oregon who uh, said, for, first words out of her mouth were, I'm ashamed to be a registered Republican. I'm absolutely ashamed of my party. I'm ashamed of my president. I'm ashamed that all of this is going on. Adam Schiff is absolutely right. Right matters. The right thing matters. And this cover up that's going on is absurd. And, you know, she just went on and she said all the right things. And I, I appreciate someone yeah. like that. Someone who really gets it that no, everything that's going on yes. here is wrong. And I'm ashamed that I was ever registered or associated with this political party. That that is a person that I can work with. What do you think about John Roberts just letting fidget spinners and Republican <laughs> read read and highlight books from Hatchet? And I mean, Marsha Blackburn is has uh, lived up to all of my expectations. Let me yes. say. She she is one of many words that we don't use on this podcast. Yes, she is one of many C words we do not use on this podcast. No, uh, but, I don't I don't God. like to even think about that about people because I'm not a misogynist. But uh, her attention grabbing uh, yeah. in, and and Gloria <clears throat> Borger was on CNN this morning saying, "Yeah, this is a insecure." Uh, little lady attention grabber saying, look at me, Donald Trump. Look at me. Why don't you return well, my calls? Tweet about I wanna, me. You know? we, want, for future generations, let's mention what she actually did. Well, she's uh, reading and highlighting a book, uh, a right wing, one of these many right wing tomes. I know the publisher is Hatchet. I don't want to give the book any publicity, mm -hmm. but she's reading during the trial and highlighting passages. And, uh, She's all then another senator is fidget spinning. Oh, she's also giving interviews to Fox right. during the trial. Right. Josh Hawley, I believe, was was it's also out to the hall giving interviews during during the right. hearing. During the hearing, which yeah. is you well, should not be allowed to do that. That is, is where, against the rules, against the actual Senate rules that they've agreed to, right? This is where yeah. Ely Mistal uh, and I had a fight on Twitter. Oh no. Everybody we had a fight. We had a friendly fight. Um because I pointed out that Chief Justice John Roberts' rules of order are neither orderly nor are they rules. And he, he said, you have to end a sentence like that with discuss. And I explained to him that he's not my supervisor, and that he, <clears throat> but it was all very friendly. But the, the point being that uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, there's a, an article in the, in the paper today, Washington Post, I think, by Dana Milbank, about John Roberts is now being forced to, to, to watch to reap what he has sown. Mm -hmm. This this fucked up Republican Party and this monster president are are directly the result of Citizens United and gutting the Voting Rights Act and all the other shit that John Roberts was completely okay with and said it would not harm our democracy. And here he is forced to sit and try not to fall asleep as his Republican Party murders democracy right in front of him. And mm -hmm. and he and there are rules. Republicans are not people are not allowed to wander out of the room. They're not allowed to go on television during the hearings. There there's a whole bunch of stuff they're not allowed to do, all of which they're doing. Um, they're wandering. Republicans are wandering out of the room. They're going on television and they're lying a lot, like frequently. That Republican during the opening statements, they lied repeatedly, bald faced, verifiable lies. None of that bothered Chief Justice John Roberts. The only thing he got cranky about is when Susan Collins wrote him a note saying all the incivility was making her feel very swoony and faint. And could he pretty please make all the incivility stop? That's when he called attention to both sides being a little more civil and appreciating the, the august chambers where they're, where they're at, uh, that the rules are for other people, that we can do whatever the fuck we want. Doesn't bother him that his party's lying. None of that troubles the Supreme Court justice. Just that people are being rude to each other and it's making Susan Collins feel feel bad in her tum tum and that's sort of like yeah okay we've look you have in front of you a president of the united states who is clearly a traitor and a criminal uh there's no doubt about it you have the supreme court uh crackpot right-wing supreme court who doesn't give a shit about any of this as represented by john roberts and you have the um lunatics who put all of this in place who put donald trump in the white house who put clowns like roberts on the court um, running the Senate, 
they've they've taken over the government. The the bad people now run everything. And um, again, it, it is I was stirring and delightful, and I've played um, Adam Schiff's uh, closing yesterday over and over again about how important it is to be right and we have to stand for something. But he might as well be talking to the dead. He might as well be talking to stones, because Republicans do not care about any of that. Let's move on to your bullet point about endorsements have become the fidget spinners of politics. <laughs> yes. You might remember the last election, every paper in America endorsed Hillary Clinton. Every single one. Yep. Yeah. I think there were two exceptions, maybe two exceptions. Didn't make the slightest bit of difference. So um, in a tight race or a local race or things where you all sort of know each other on a first name basis, endorsements might matter. But endorsements at the national level they're good. You put them in your campaign ads, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they don't really seem to matter that much, except to give you something to fight about. <laughs> give you well, something. And, for- and uh- these right wingers who are endorsing Bernie at, in a cynical way to help Trump. Oh yeah. Hugh oh, Hewitt. I, I mean, I, you know, if you were to blindfold uh, the average democratic voter mm-hmm. and say, uh, guess who uh, Joe Rogan Ben Shapiro and Hugh Hewitt have all endorsed. Yeah. And and you and you gave them a million guesses. <laughs> they, I don't think they'd ever say, really, Bernie Sanders. They've all endorsed Bernie Sanders. Yes, because in their mind, I'm not saying this is true. I'm not saying it's valid. I'm not saying it's an improper calculation or not. I'm saying in their minds, he's the easiest candidate to beat. Yep. So that they well, that, that in- is actually, that is exactly what Hugh Hewitt said. That's yes. not... We aren't making that up or or intoning that they that no. is their motive. That's what they that say is their motive. Their motive. They, yes, they believe since they have open primaries and, and they and they have the ability to do it, um, there are Republicans who are absolutely villainous scumbags who are endorsing Bernie Sanders on the theory that he is the easiest person to to beat up, and if he loses, he's the easiest one to pull voters away from because they're not really interested in in democratic policies. They just want someone to burn the fucking place down. Well, and that's what Hugh Hewitt is saying. And right. that more than giving any, you know, imagined opinion about this. No, this is what he said. Hugh saying. Hewitt has flat out said that. Yes. So this is this is the point is that this cynical out in the open rat fucking is what's going on. No, I have great comfort in the fact that Hugh Hewitt is always wrong about everything. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter what Hugh Hewitt says. What troubles me, of course, as always, is that Hugh Hewitt is on my television. Hugh Hewitt yeah. has yeah. no business being anywhere near my television. Um, who is who is on in the morning uh, covering impeachment? It's it's Chuck Todd and Rich Lowry and Peggy Noonan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wrote a whole thing this week about why let's all get over this fantasy that history will eventually make conservatives pay a price for being awful people. No, it won't. All I ever see when I turn on television are conservatives who've never paid a price for being completely yeah. fucking wrong about everything, who have been who were wrong going back to the Clinton administration, and all they've ever been is promoted. So let's get over the fact that at some point in the future, some generation of people who are apparently going to be way smarter than we are are going to say, you know what? Maybe it was a really bad idea to have Chuck Todd on television. Maybe it was a really bad idea for Brett Stevens to have a column in the New York Times, because that day will never come. Because in, until we start holding people accountable now, those days will never dawn. And we've already demonstrated, the, the media has already demonstrated that it has no interest in holding people accountable, Republicans accountable. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment. Sure. Advocate with me. What if what Hugh Hewitt and all these TV cable pundits say uh-huh. yes. just doesn't matter? Right. It's just filler between ads anyway. Mm-hmm. And I, I look at our kids who are voting the ones especially the two that are going to be able to vote this year right Mm -hmm. uh they don't watch hugh hewitt they don't care what peggy noonan says they can't they wouldn't be able to pick her out of a you know lineup of ladies at the grocery store absolutely true so i do think that they will pay a republicans are going to pay a price in history but it's a change in demography that says oh yeah that party they made my mom cry over health care right they they think that uh my rights over reproductive issues is the same as slavery right you, <laughs> betsy, betsy devos is comparing the uh abortion issue to slavery right and not in a good way 
uh, she kind of gets it the opposite. So, well, I'll tell you, I had a talk with Junior Dude about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, very much like climate change. Mm -hmm. How do you, how does it feel to, you know, as, as speaking for your entire generation, right? <laughs> how does it feel that a whole bunch of 40, 50, 60 and 70 year olds are saying, yeah, we fucked everything up and yeah, we're not going to fix it. We're just going to keep putting these assholes in front of you. We're not going to touch climate change, but you will take care of it. This is on you to figure out. This is on you to fix. We realize it's a problem, but we're not going to do shit about it. Now I realize that, that, um, None of his peers know who the hell Peggy Noonan is or care. They don't read David Brooks. They don't care. And that's all fine. That's good. That's healthy. But what those people are, are an army of idiots who control the national conversation, who control the parameters of our national political discussion. And their control means there will, there will always be now from now on until the end of time or until their, that generation just smashes them completely and takes over. Conversations will take place between Joe Scarborough on the left and Ben Shapiro on the right. The whole, but I, I think that's at a level that you're paying very intense att attention to. And here's and here's why: because when you actually talk to people in the world who are too cynical to get involved themselves in politics, who who are just like "fuck it, I don't want to vote," you know, all the fifty percent of the people who don't want to touch anything. What do you hear them say? Both sides are terrible. Both sides are awful. But the whole system is shit. The whole system is crap. Where did they get that idea from? It didn't spontaneously spring up out of nowhere. It came. They didn't up, get it from Joe Scarborough. They got it. They got it from. from where, where do you think they got it from? I think they got it from the bar where everyone is terrified to have an opinion. Yes, and where where does every? I mean, literally, tens of millions of people in this country believe both sides are are bad and wrong and equally so. Now, now. I can only point to a large multi-billion dollar corporation that controls the cameras and the microphones and the newspapers mm -hmm. who've been feeding them on local editorial pages. You know who's in our local pa paper today? Kellyanne Conway. Mm. So who's been feeding them this bullshit for 30 years? Who's been reinforcing every time you turn around, every time there's a mistake, every time there's a stub toe – from from Chris Matthews to NPR, what's the answer every time a Republican blows some shit up? Oh, both sides do it. Both sides are terrible. If you repeat that across enough platforms, yeah, uh, enough platforms for enough decades, people will believe it. So you're saying that that has then seeped the into people, the groundwater, essentially. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's 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 poisoned everything. It's killed everything. The, and this is something that I think Jay Rose would agree with me on, which is this this. Um, false equivalence this big lie that both sides are equally bad is mm -hmm. the big lie and it's the, it, it's the big lie that enables the lunatics on the right to continue getting worse because every time they get caught they know all they have to do is say well democrats are just as bad and there'll be an entire media that will rush to embrace them and say well you know you're right you're right everyone's bad everyone's awful and it is that big lie that permits the right to do the horrible things they do and get away with. I think there's it. a bigger lie on top of that big lie. Ooh, I love a bigger, a bigger lie, lie mm -hmm. than the both sides do it, and that is white supremacy. And I think that yeah. is actually the sort of stratospheric lie that is sometimes so present as to be invisible. But the both siderist lie that allows one side to continue to be evil because both sides, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Reinforces and endorses uh, racism. And, but if you yeah. poke that balloon with the racism word, television networks are very nervous about appearing racist. I think that's the wedge that we use to remove both siderism from the media. I, I agree. And here's the thing you are on the side of the angels, you are also in the majority. There are more people like Blue Gal in this country than there are people like Hugh Hewitt by a lot. So how do I keep it so that the Hugh Hewitts and Ben Shapiro's and Brett Stevens's of the world continue to have control over every government institution? My greatest weapon is your apathy. Mm -hmm. I want to convince enough people who would ordinarily be on your side on everything that nothing matters because everyone is wrong. That the political system itself is broken beyond repair. So fuck it. Why not let Russian run everything? 
that that everybody's wrong, everyone's corrupt, both sides are terrible. Your you know the apathy is the greatest weapon of the oppressor. Getting people to, to just shrug their shoulders and say, "Well, nothing can be done because everyone's corrupt." This is the greatest weapon that the right wing has on, at its disposal, and it that that ammunition is being belt fed into their machine guns by by the press every day in every newspaper and on every television camera in America. And that's what terrifies me is that it is not that they are terrible. They are clearly terrible. It's the people who should be rising up against them are not because they believe just go back to the last election. Just go back to 2016. Go back to Matthew fucking Dow, the ABC news chief political analyst. Well, you know, if you're going to talk about sexual predators, like Donald Trump, you have to talk about Hillary's emails because both sides are terrible. Every side's awful. What we need is disruption and to overthrow the whole system. That's because underneath he knew Hillary was going to win. It's perfectly safe to, to, to talk about tossing the whole system out the door when you know that mom will fix it. <laughs> and it turned out mom didn't fix it. And now we're fucked. So the, the, the playing on people's contempt for politics and their ignorance of politics and their willingness to take the cheap and easy answer out, which is everybody's wrong. Who the fuck cares? Nothing matters. Everyone's corrupt. Because that makes you sound smart. Yeah. That yeah. makes you sound cosmopolitan, like you know what you're talking about. It, it, because activists cry on C-SPAN. Yeah. People who care cry. They, they bleed. They, they, they get angry. And it's much easier to just be aloof from it all and just say, yeah, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect me. It's not really that important. Obama was just as bad. Bush was just as bad. Everyone was just as bad as everyone else. That is the great lie that the media sells to everyone. That's that's the one that scares me the most. And you're right. It's it's on top of that. The 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 shielding on top of that is white supremacy. Yep. Time out Couldn't time out, more. drift class. Chris Matthews yes. says we can't call them lies anymore. Yeah. Thank God for Chris <laughs> Matthews, right? Thank God for Chris Matthews accidentally blurting out. Oh, wait, we can't call them lies anymore. Uh, they uh, told us oh, the oh, yeah, uh, not to call them hmm. lies anymore. Yeah. You can just hear the, the sound of uh, of the taser um, <laughs> choke collar he's wearing. <laughs> going, going, <laughs> oh, no, 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 sorry. We can't, we're not allowed to call them lies anymore. Sorry, Phil. Sorry, Andy. Didn't mean to call them lies. They're just, you know, uh, half truths. All right, and so you have a couple quotes here that that yes. you want our listeners to guess who said this. I it, this just cracked me up this week. I, I'm looking for humor everywhere I can. The find The same it. person was staunchly defending how capitalist free markets ruthlessly weed out the incompetent. Yes, and said, last week. Quote: It was yet another epic failure of political punditry. Unquote. And also said. Quote, it's the 947th consecutive sign that we in the coastal chattering classes have not cured our insularity problem, unquote. Yes. This was David Brooks. David, was David Brooks. Brooks. Today. This is David Brooks today saying that, God, I suck at my job. <laughs> Punches all suck at our job. We're terrible at everything. We never get anything right. We're a bunch of fucking idiots. Drift class was right. But you know what? Here's the funny thing. Here's the punchline. We can never be fired. <laughs> We're never going to be unemployed. We're never even going to be reprimanded. Do you think I, that I, Do you think that this column today was a response to his colleagues at the New York Times, though? Waving, th thumbing his nose at those who called him out by name earlier this oh, week? I, I know. It was about Joe Biden. Oh, okay. His column was about Joe Biden, but it was about, yeah, Joe Biden's surprisingly strong. You know, all the pundits said Joe Biden didn't stand a chance. I don't oh know anybody God. who said that. But the, the lead in was literally him, his rubbing his ass in, in, in the Schulzberger family noses collectively going, I suck at my job. And I've been doing it for your paper for a fucking fortune for 16 years. I've always been bad at my job. I will always be bad at my job. And you keep paying me and you keep giving me all the credibility that comes with the title New York Times columnist. Thank you very much. And I just sat there going, wow, literally a week ago, David Brooks is arguing, don't worry, people. Capitalism will sort all this shit out. <laughs> Capitalism weeds out incompetent people. Free markets may seem fair, but you know people get paid on the basis of their competence and ability and skills. And eventually it all just sort of works out. And, I, and speaking of that, let me let me say thank you to to uh, Michael Bloomberg this week. Yeah. Uh, for going after Susan Collins. Yeah. With money. The only yeah, that, thing 
the Republican Party is scared of more than a Donald Trump tweet is Bloomberg money coming into their race. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I I don't think Michael Bloomberg's going to be president. I no. don't think Michael Bloomberg thinks Michael Bloomberg is going to be president. Yeah. Hard to know, but what you know what he he's got enough money to have that size ego, so that's what he does. Uh, but I am grateful to him for turning his money hose on to Senate races. Yeah, and uh, I did think that his response was funny uh, about yeah. billionaires in the race. Someone asked him about billionaires in the race, and he said, "Really, who's the other one? Yeah. <laughs> Do we really need two billionaires so, in this race? Yeah, who's who's the other one?" And grateful that he is definitely uh, dancing around in Donald Trump's head. Yes. Uh, in a way that no one else can be. So well, I wish it weren't true. But, you know, to get rid of uh, of Governor Hedge Fund, Bruce Rauner, we had to bring in a billionaire. We did. We had to bring in uh, J.B. Pritzker. And J.B. Pritzker has been doing a very fine job for he, as far as I he, can tell. He, unlike some other governors who won in the blue wave, yeah. uh, I think he definitely recognizes where his voters came from. Yes, and sure does how he needs to serve his base mm -hmm. and he's doing pretty much all the right things. He's as yeah. uh, a progress. He is running the state as a progressive. Yeah. So, you know, shrug my shoulders and say, well, you know, who, who knew, who knew that this, he would really put his uh, political career on the line and do the right thing. And so far, so good. He signed I would say contracts that were long overdue. Yep. The pot is now legal under legalized pot. Um, yeah, he is restoring voting rights uh, and uh, uh, to a bunch of people. He is um, like voiding a whole bunch of traffic shit that should never have been done. Um, and may I say that for this next race, where which in which he is not running, right. uh, he is doing more than I have ever seen any politician do to get the youth vote yes. out. Yes, he is. He has uh, signed a bill to allow high school students who can vote, mm -hmm. who have their voter registration card to leave school for two hours to go vote. Yep. Now, which high school student is not going to do that to get out of school for two hours? Well, if, if there's an hour at the, um, you know. at the uh, uh, HCI uh, marijuana distributor. And then, <laughs> then an hour voting. Cause, and then, and, you know, With mom's debit card, right? right? <laughs> well, I don't think they take debit cards. They might. I don't know. Um, no, uh, junior dudes. Uh, junior, junior dudes, an expert in that's this. That's true. And, and here's the <laughs> they thing: they take debit cards and they take cash, and that's and, it. And our polling place, they serve yep. baked goods for people who come in and vote. So it's a munchie stop. Yeah, they do. You know? So there you go. You got your munchies. They've got a lemon bar for and, you. And so you're things, all set. I would be remiss if I if I didn't mention. Um, there's a, a boulevard near our home, MacArthur Boulevard, um, which is in a radical state of disrepair and has been for a very, very long time since long before we moved here. It's been a freaking mess. It's part of the highway system, technically part of the highway system. And it's, everyone's just been shrugging their shoulders about what can be done. And a big bugaboo, there's a word you don't hear enough these days um, of the association that I'm a member of is fixing this boulevard, you know, putting in bike lanes and, and repairing the sidewalk so humans can walk on it. People with disabilities can cross no, oh, it's got huge drainage yeah. problems and potholes, and it's it's a bad. It's been in bad shape, like you and, say. And for there are time, yeah. there, you know, there were like five plans on the table, but nobody took them seriously because there's no money. And now mm -hmm. there's money, and there's yeah. money because the city and the state and uh, went to the governor and said, "We need a big slice of this uh, of every capital bill to fix A, B, C, and D." He said, "Yeah, good. Well, that's well worth it." Here you go. So now there's actual real money to do real infrastructure repairs in places that people mm -hmm. actually care about. Um, that will make a major thoroughfare in the city of Springfield much more yeah, livable. Yeah. So, yep. and that never. And environmentally sound yeah. because the drainage uh, helps the sewers, helps climate change. Help, I mean, it's all going to be lead, e, you know, e friendly, yeah. e eco friendly less um kind of pure asphalt bs they're really they're really working on making it as green as possible and green spaces as well that's going on so my degree of involvement which is not you know up to my chin it's up to my waist is yeah. how much goes into 
acquiring properties and moving people's businesses mm -hmm. and digging things up and, and the age of the sewers and the various ownership of the road and we right. have to transfer ownership from the state to the city and blah, 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 who pays for that, all of which is, you know, a subject for an entirely different podcast than this one. But none mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. would have happened with with uh, Brown or his governor. None of it. None of it right. would have happened. No Republican governor was yeah. going to do squat. And that's, yep. you know, that's yep. one among many, many, many things that happens when you have a progressive governor who is also a billionaire. So I'm saying this is yeah. not the hand yeah. I would choose. This is a hand I was dealt. So thank you, Mike Bloomberg, for dropping a lot of money uh, and promising to spend big money on Senate races. You know, right. that's that's right. big. That's a big deal. You know, we we do our little um, tip jar and uh, we give five bucks where we can to candidates that we like. And my wife, you know, writes her hands to the bone for you people doing postcards, doing postcards <laughs> for voters. Postcards for voters. I mean, yep. doors, but, yep. you know, we don't have that kind of throw throw weight. We don't have that kind of power. But there are some people who do. And I do respect people who are willing to put their money on the table and say, I'm going to I'm willing to pay for a, for a broad agenda. And not f solely for my ego, and I'm 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 very grateful for that. I wish you know there are way too many billionaires in this country. We don't need billionaires mm -hmm, in this country, mm -hmm. and we need a much higher tax rate. And there's a whole bunch of things that, if if I were omnipotent and godlike in my powers, I would have done. But as as I said on Twitter yesterday, it's a really good thing I don't have omnipotent godlike powers right now. It's so important. <laughs> there were there were a couple nights this week. What switching over to Fox. Oh. And and seeing them cover the impeachment for 22 seconds and then move on to socialism is going to destroy yeah. America, where, you know, you were just like, I'm glad I don't have a laser beam that would go straight through the yeah. TV to Sean Hannity's studio, because that would no, be I, bad. I, I, I'm, just, I'm praying, <laughs> don't give me Billy Moomy's power in It's it's a Good Life. Oh, no, <laughs> that'd be so bad right now because I would use them. That would be sad. sending everybody yeah. to the cornfield. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, oh, look, here's a peach and peach. Hey, look, it's it's uh. It's Tucker Carlson interviewing Tulsi Gabbard. About the yeah. Election. Oh, they're both in the cornfield yeah. now. Oh, it's, it's a peach and peach. Oh, look, it's it's breaking Hunter Biden news. Uh, it, uh -huh. it, Everybody in the cornfield. <laughs> gently trying to reason with them, leaving little breadcrumbs of truth to lead them into enlightenment is not going to work because we've been trying that for decades. Yeah. That doesn't work. Well, and when I had to look at for work at Crooks and Liars, I had to work look this week at... The fact that, as I said last night, they spent 22 seconds on live impeachment right. coverage. Fox News did. In in prime time, their total prime time airing live impeachment trial was 22 seconds. And so I went back to look at how Fox News has spent their time for the past 10 years, you know, just mm -hmm. scrolling through things. And they spent three hours on Michael Bay's Benghazi movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Three hours. <laughs> Yep. So, uh, yeah, this and, and that's when I sat down and just went, OK, they are enemies. Yeah. They are enemies of this country. Yes, they are. Uh, we got to do a news roundup. Drift yes, we do. Because people might not in the future might want to know what happened this week. And now we're going <laughs> to tell you um, the Senate opened its impeachment hearings uh, trial this 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 week. Um, Donald Trump becomes the third president to be impeached in American history and the worst one of all. And as Nancy Pelosi said, impeachment is forever. Yeah. Representative Jerry Nadler, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee and one of the impeachment managers, mm -hmm. said, The charges set forth in the first article of impeachment are firmly grounded in the Constitution of the United States. And he also said, quote, No president has ever used his office to compel a foreign nation to help him cheat in our elections. Yeah. I think that word cheat is an easy one for a lot of people to it understand. It. It and I'm glad they're using that it. Junior and I talked about Nixon. I said, oh, no, this is mm -hmm. much worse than Nixon. Yeah, yep. this is Nixon plus um, um, Benedict Arnold. You know, this yeah. is just every, every possible thing that the founders of this country were terrified might happen has now happened. And I got to say, I agree with uh, Jennifer Rubin. In that Republicans have a choice between saying yes he's guilty or saying he's utterly mentally incompetent. Yeah. Well, it's that's that's your choice. It's, it's the Lindsey Graham psycho, psycho defense. Yeah, <laughs> which he was screaming this morning. Literally was in his mind. He thinks this is okay. Saying you're a psychotic is not actually a defense. It's a plea for mercy, 
It's a it's a desperate plea to please drag him away to a rubber room. And never drag him away to the home rather than drag him away to prison. That's what you're saying. saying yes. You're too psychotic to understand that what you're doing is wrong is not actually a defense. Uh, and it's you might. But what else do you have? I mean, what else does he have? Right. Um, and because we have a venal treasonous um, psycho running the country with the approval of the entire Republican Party, that administration will now strip federal pollution protections from rivers, streams, and wetlands. And watch some of those conservative states out West rush Mm -hmm. to reinstate those protections as state law. It's going to be hilarious. The director of national intelligence failed to turn over a report to Congress on the killing of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. They were supposed to, they didn't, but they just don't follow the law anymore. Uh, Donald Trump is now the first sitting president to attend and address the anti-choice fanatic March for Life. Can I talk about that for a moment? I wish you would. Because he went on and on about newborn babies and how precious they are, and he was very sentimental about it. Yeah. And uh, I tweeted, yeah, and then they turned five months old, and that's when you're allowed to go raw dog a porn star on the side. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, how many abortions has Donald Trump paid for is a question on Twitter this morning. Or how many children have you stripped from their mothers and thrown in cages and lost that track too. of? There's a whole list you of know. questions. He is returning to the solidly insane core of his base. Yeah. If, you know, the 47th March for Life are the people who are in denial about reality anyway. Yeah. Uh, so this is where he can go to get claps. And that's what he went to do. Yeah. They're called Republicans. Donald Trump further embarrassed the country by bragging about withholding materials from Congress during a news conference at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Well, he said, we have all the material. They don't have the material. We have it all. So he's bragging about the second article of impeachment, yeah, and all. I'm guilty. We have it all. Yep. You got nothing. You got nothing on me, copper. Following the Iranian airstrikes at the al-Assad airbase in Iraq that injured a number of American soldiers, Donald Trump said he doesn't consider concussion symptoms reported by the soldiers to be very serious injuries, saying they were probably just headaches because he loves the troops so much. He just dismisses their probable concussions as mere head. You know, complainers. You know what whiners soldiers are. Lordy, there are tapes. The Daily Beast reports that there is a tape of Donald Trump uh, trying to fire Ukrainian ambassador uh, saying the ter- words take her out, which no one has ever heard of firing a person that way. Uh, to me, the most convincing arguments in this impeachment trial, and I was already convinced, yeah. but um, first of all, the fact that Donald Trump didn't care one squat whether there was an actual investigation nope. of Joe Biden or not. Nope, have- it just had to be an announcement. Yeah. Um, and secondly, that he is doing things that he would be able to do through channels perfectly legally with no one questioning him. And he's using Rudy Giuliani instead. Yeah, his, he's, us, he's using a front man. He's using a, a one page letter to the ambassador would send her home. Yes, period. Well, and, and you get to the, and you, and you find out, and, and part of the, this three day marathon is hearing details that you've heard before mm-hmm. compressed into a, a, a one gigantic presentation. This is 13 weeks. This is an entire Netflix series compressed into three days. Yeah. When you found out uh, in the, in these marathon hearings, you didn't find out when they repeated the fact that Rudy Giuliani was literally rewriting the script line by line of what they had to say in Ukraine. It wasn't enough to say corruption. It wasn't enough to say uh, we're going to launch an investigation. It's like, no, no, you got to say Joe Biden. You got to say Burisma and Joe Biden. You got to go on CNN. You got to do it that way. It was so clear that this was being scripted by a shitty reality TV star. That this is this. You have to say these exact words in this order or you get nothing. You don't get aid. You don't get a visit. You don't get shit. And it was, oh, so this is all just a show. This is lit- there's literally nothing more here than you need the headline. That then you can start with your rallies, lock him up. Then Joe Biden can be the subject of your hate rallies. And you can wave it over your head like a bloody rag and say, Joe Biden is corrupt and here's the proof. They're doing it. They're doing it. That was your entire election strategy. And the entire Republican Party is completely cool with that. Um, I, I do have one more actual news item before we move on to the local news. 
uh, as much as we complain about the media, I'm going to put up a link uh, from Jay Rosen to Mary Louise Kelly of NPR, who absolutely nails Mike Pompeo to the wall. Good for her. And I, I want to spoil it for you. It's like 45 seconds long, and it will make you smile when you hear a reporter doing the job that a reporter is supposed to do. And in local news, local elected idiot, our Congressman Rodney Davis, thinks that Nancy Pelosi's partisanship is the most damaging thing to America. It's more damaging than Russia hacking our elections. He's got yeah, to go. he's got to go. He's got to go. Um, and they all, have their, they all have their talking point. There's one talking point that all... House Republicans have clearly been issued from on high, which is uh, we have to get through this partisan Democrat uh, witch hunt as fast as possible so that we can get back to doing bipartisan things for the American people. <laughs> now, House Republicans are not interested in doing bipartisan things for anyone. Um, anything that is passed with any sort of bipartisan support or any support at all is guaranteed to be murdered by Mitch McConnell the minute it hits his desk. So that's all bullshit. It is simply the only thing they have left to say. So they're all repeating it over and over again. I've heard two or three Republican House members on the radio in the last week all saying exactly the same thing. Yep, we have to get back to bipartisan so, solutions for the American people is the phrase that they have all been taught to say. Yeah. yeah. So he's got to go. And you know, you know, you know what we need to I, I ran into uh, uh, Betsy Dirksen Lodegren's mother today. Oh, you did. Yes, I did. And uh, what we need are 2,100 votes. That's going to be tough. But if we can get the college students to turn out, we can do it. Uh, she, he, she got beat by 2,000 votes. I don't know that she's going to be the Democratic nominee. I, I assume she will be. But mm -hmm. uh, he won by 2,000 votes and change. There needs to mm -hmm. be an, an entire... That's, that's a lot in a lot. this district. That's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. But we'll do our part. Guarantee. I promise you, we will do our part. We will walk holes in our shoes. We will phone bank. We'll do whatever we have to do to get these sons of bitches out of power. I think it's going to boil down to college students. I, I really right. do, whether because U of I is on, in our district, so that's it's got to happen that way. Ah, and that doesn't mean I'm not going to do my part to get the no, vote out. No, on the contrary, I'll bake cookies. Uh, I'll bake whatever good. cookies you need. <laughs> All right. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's internet kitty is not a kitty; it's a parrot, African Timna gray parrot. His name is Casper, and it is spelled the Polish way, K-A-C-P-E-R. Uh, our listener wrote in and said, I would like to nominate Casper for Internet Birdie of the Week. He is named after a character from my mother's favorite Polish soap opera. Wow. The name worked out well because the character in the soap opera was a gangsta who always broke the law. And my Casper knows how to get anything he wants by stealing or sweet talking. His favorite thing to say to get a treat is, Mama, I love you. He also loves freshly poured bird pellets. And it, once they are no longer freshly poured, he just throws them at people passing by his cage. He loves giving kisses, so we let him run the entire household. <laughs> Well, I would too. Absolutely. Sure. He's he's a very sweet, pretty bird. And uh, you should go visit Casper at our Facebook page and website. Freshly Poured Cat Food is our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store, perfection, or dollar store dreck, your cat or bird will sit on the kitchen floor or his or her perch and demand that the only food they will eat is freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service Go Postal Unions, letter on the air unless you say otherwise and drift glass we got a letter from someone i'm just going to call them aj all right and it's a very long letter but i'm going to read one paragraph because i told everyone last week i love hearing about your boots on the ground and what's yeah. going on politically in your district yes this aj wrote us and said please know that you have a fan and a friend out here in the finger lakes 
If you're looking for stories and examples of where people have had it and are organizing and changing our politics and are real fighting Democrats, check out what we have going in New York's 27th. I think 2020 is going to be another blue tsunami that returns a Democrat to Congress from our area. An improvement since we're currently unrepresented by Chris Collins, who's now going to jail. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So at least until our special election in the spring, that election will be a bellwether for the rest of the crazy season. I wish you very, very well, AJ, in putting a Democrat in that seat. It's about time. And thank you so much for writing. We really appreciate it. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. We're going to leave our GoFundMe for our 10th anniversary open one more week. So if you uh, would like to give us an anniversary present of 5 or 10 bucks, we would really appreciate it. There's a link at our website, and I'll also put one up at our Facebook page for our GoFundMe. Thank you very much for that. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties are claiming executive privilege to protect future Internet Kitties from porn star hush money. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license, copyright 2019 2020, DGBG Productions.